Hello, and welcome back to the Squiddish Podcast. This is season two. We're here. Yay. And I I figured it was a good time to go to season two because I got a new microphone. So yeah, there's going to be no real difference, but it's season two now. Welcome to season two. This is episode one, or technically episode 16, if we're counting. And today we're going to talk about nudibranches. So like land snails, nudibranches, or sea slugs as they're more commonly known, are mollusks and gastropods. Nudibranch actually means naked gill, and we'll get into sort of why they're called naked gills in a little bit further down the episode. But like land snails and cephalopod members of the mollusk phylum, sea slugs are some of the most interesting looking animals around. They come in a vast array of colors and shapes, and they can actually consume the cells of their prey and take on a similar coloring while they're feeding on that prey. So they're kind of similar to octopus and squid in the way that they can change the color of themselves. And we're going to talk very generally about sea slugs. Not all sea slugs can do that, can take on the cells of their prey and become a different color, Um, but many can. So we're just going to talk very vaguely about sea slugs because, to be honest, they aren't as intellectually interesting as a lot of cephalopods. There are a few key elements that separate sea slugs from their cousins, the land snails, or other cephalopods. Um, Number one, their shells are obviously internal. This is really interesting because we have seen this exact thing happen with cephalopods without shells because they still have the remnants of those ancient ammonoid ancestors. They still have that internal shell. Number two, because of their lack of shell, a lot of sea slugs have developed biological and chemical defenses in order to defend themselves and deflect predators, which of course we've seen in Numerous cephalopods and land snails as well do this. Number three, they have rhinophores atop their heads that help them identify prey. So rhinophores are like those little antenna-like formations atop the head that you would see on a regular slug or snail. And rhinophores are used in scent reception and they can help identify changes in water currents. So if some predator is coming towards them, they can feel that that change, and those rhinophores are really sensitive to that. Number four, they have exposed gills or serrata. Having gills along their back that are completely open to the elements and to predators is super dangerous, but it also allows them to maintain the high oxygen levels that they need. Their gills come in a variety of sizes, shapes, colors, and they're located around the anus. So yeah, they breathe through their butthole. Some nudibranches actually lack defined gills and instead have what are called serrata, which I mentioned before, which resemble the branches of a tree. And these limb-like extensions of their body help to absorb gases from the water and allow them to breathe. So this is sort of why they're called naked gills because, or nudibranches, because their gills are totally exposed. In many ways, we can see the similarity between nudibranches and cephalopods. Sea slugs have oral tentacles and rhinophores atop their head that act similarly to tentacles. They have gills, a molluscan foot, and an internal shell. Many sea slugs have developed an adaptation which allows them to consume and digest nematocysts. Nematocysts are just the cells of stinging animals like jellyfish, and they can do this without any repercussions. Many can consume these cells, these cells and use them to sting prey themselves. It's thought that they avoid being stung themselves by using their mucus to prevent the firing of nematocysts. So where do you find these sea slugs? Well, up until recently, sea slugs were thought to only live in marine water until scientists started discovering them slowly forcing their way into brackish water um, or water that's not quite fresh water. 
but has lower salinity than the ocean. So over time, there has been evidence that they have adapted to lower salinities, most likely out of necessity. Although sea slugs are thought to have rudimentary forms of intelligence based solely on breeding, eating, other basic functions, scientists have actually studied their brain waves a lot. Um, they have, because their brains are not very complex, they don't have very many brain cells, it's actually very easy to map their brains. So that has helped with a lot of research into Alzheimer's and dementia. They actually share some genetic similarities in their brains with people who have Alzheimer's and dementia, which is shocking. Scientists have actually been able to create artificial connections in the brain cells of nudibranches, and that is a huge feat. Um, basically, they were able to rewire the brain and signals that would maybe originally cause the nudibranch to swim might cause the nudibranch to kind of jerk wildly to the left now. So they have done all of this discovery into artificial connections with nudibranches because their brains are so easily malleable. So that's where I think I'm going to end the episode. I know it's a little shorter, but it's the first one back. And for some reason, this episode was very difficult to write because there really isn't a lot of information about the intelligence of nudibranches. I wish that there was more, but unfortunately I don't really think nudibranches are all that super intelligent. So <laughs> they're, you know, almost like plants. So thank you so much for joining me and I will see y'all next week.